the theoretical and the conceptual framework within which we develop Berliner Seen, which I think has a resonance to how we think about uh, digital humanities uh, also as a field of research uh, today. Uh, but most importantly, Berliner Seen was developed from the, out, from the start as a pedagogical project. Uh, and I think this is really important. It's not something that then moved into the, the pedagogical realm, into the classroom, but it started really out to thinking just exclusively about the, the classroom. And it has an, had an interesting life in going back in a, in a way to, to the research, even though that was one of the foundations to that. Uh, and then Ellen will uh, talk extensively about, you know, in her voice, I hope for, that will work, um, uh, about what's happening actually in the classroom. How do you use this, this project? So, um, and then we'll, I'll come back to making the connections to digital, digital humanities again. So, just a couple of uh, definitions. You know, this is, these are just randomly uh, selected def definitions from the question of you've heard about that the day of the age which has been going on since 2009 uh, and people have been sort of contributing their their own definitions of, of this and this is a very broad one using new methods to find out more about old things well you know that's okay but not just only about old things you know that's one point of view Here's a more extensive one, someone who is much more critical and said, well, you know, we talk about humanities. Why do we need the digital? No one talks about, um, uh, you know, digital astronomy or so. Is it's, it's just a tool. And then this person goes on and just, well, computers allow for doing things with texts uh, and other cultural artifacts that could not be done feasibly without uh, the computational power. Yes, that's uh, certainly true. Uh, computers should be considered an extension of the scholar's mind, very useful tools indeed. My sense is this is focusing it a little bit too much onto the tool aspect, on the computational aspect, just the tool. But there's much more to that as we've heard uh, this morning. And here's one that's also, you know, going a little more into the uh, pedagogical realm, but in a very specific way. You know, it's the critical pedagogy uh, together with the practices of new media culture. So you can actually see people have very different ideas of what digital humanities is and how they can themselves get engaged in that and bring in their own background into that. Quite often I like to go back to an older definition uh, that uh, appeared <clears throat> on Wikipedia and that was in, in 2011. When you look at it now it's much more diverse and not, I think, not as clearly uh, defined as uh, some of the aspects here. And here it says it's clearly a field of research, teaching, and invention. So it's really coming these three aspects, uh, bringing them together. And of course, intersection of computing and the disciplines of the humanities. We've, we know that, that's, but I think the other aspect, it's, it's really methodological. So it's really rethinking the methods of teaching and, and research and it's interdisciplinary. And we've seen great examples this morning, you know, from biology to classical studies and, and <clears throat> Jewish studies, museum, the world. You know, I think this is a core aspect of that. But it's also about the investigation, analysis, synthesis, and presentation. So we need to think about not only how do we do the research, but also how do we uh, get it out there. And we've uh, seen really interesting examples this morning as well. And someone also mentioned it. Uh, that, you know, on the one hand, we study the media that affect the discipline, so it really changes the way we do our uh, research, but it also has a feedback, so it also has a, a, a way back to contribute to our knowledge of computing, and this is something, especially being involved in the development of technology, that is something that we've always uh, experienced. Berliner Zane, just a quick outline, as I said, you know, we'll talk a little bit about the conceptual approach, then about the material and the interaction design, uh, then how do we employ storytelling and meaning making primarily in, in the classroom, and then also what kind of pedagogical impact uh, we've seen. There's of course much more to talk about, but you know, first I would like to talk a little bit about some of the uh, conceptual foundations of Berliner Seen, and as I said, we started in uh, 1990, and this was also a time when hypertext was a really big uh, topic people were talking about. And uh, the concept of hypertext, not necessarily the term, but the concept of hypertext goes back to Vannevar Bush. 
Um, and he was a, a scientist and a dean at MIT, but then worked for the American government, you know, in part of the warfare. Uh, and <clears throat> he was charged with rethinking the ways we organize information. And we have very hierarchical ways of thinking about how to organize information, how to access information. But there was so much more knowledge coming about, so the, the, his concern was how can we connect uh, knowledge across the disciplines and across these hierarchies that otherwise we wouldn't be able to do very easily. So what he came up with is uh, a way of thinking about knowledge and information in an associative way. Uh, and meaning that the association that also the individual uh, researchers, the individual scholars bring to that notion. Um, so it's not just the hierarchical, but it's much more how the human mind thinks. You know, when we read something, we have something else in mind, and then we connect it to that, uh, and that's, that's very important. So what he's done here is really think, he devised a machine which was never built, uh, but it's a, a very good conceptual uh, idea. Uh, and there, on the one hand, there are discrete elements. In this case, it's the bow and, and, and arrow. So people can actually go through um, you know, an archive of these materials and then select cert certain ones and, and add their own understanding to this. So, and these new co connections and these collections of, of uh, individual items form a new whole. And this whole, what do he then call you know, the, the trails, could be communicated to another scholar who could then add to that. So there's a process of constant rethinking, reassociating, and recombining recomb involved. And I think that's a very core concept. And this was an article uh, that appeared in 1945 in the Atlantic Monthly, inspired you know, a lot of people, including Tim Berners-Lee, who then started uh, thinking about and conceptualizing the World Wide Web. But there are many aspects in here that have never been realized in, in the World Wide Web. Uh, the other uh, foundation for this is um, Theodore Helm, Helm Nelson's Literary Machines. Uh, he was the one who actually coined the term um, uh, hypertext. And here you see sort of a typical way as also how we think of, of the, the, the World Wide Web. You know, they're interconnected uh, elements that with many different connections, not just one connection, but many in and out connections. But there's also a lot more. When we think about uh, literary aesthetic models as, as a principle, we all know what a palimpsest is. You know, there are other texts shining through. And that's very important because, as we will have heard already this morning, there, there are texts that refer to other texts that shine through. And this is sort of a, a, a schematic of that. So the, on the top level, uh, level, you have one text, but then other texts that have uh, again, relationship to other texts shine through. So, so a text is, we talked about, you talked about the mosaic, is really a text that comes together from many different sources. And that's also uh, connected then to several different literary theories. Uh, of course, there's reader's response theory, Wolfgang Isa, and that's really thinking about the dialogue between the text and the reader. And text, when we when I talk about text, I also mean media text. So it's really that we are constructing uh, the meaning, we're constructing uh, the, the interpretation when we read the text. And of course, that changes over time uh, and so on. Uh, Umberto Eco you know, focused a little more on, on the text itself and, and, and the, uh, the, the author. So texts for him are really fields of meaning that can have multitudes of, of interpretations. So again, what uh, Bush said about the associations, also the individual who's coming in with their own world knowledge and so on to bring uh, interpretation and meaning to, to the text. And of course, there's Roland Barthes, uh, the death of the author. Um, again, we've heard that this morning. Also, meaning of a text is actively constructed by, by the reader. So this is the context within which we started uh, thinking about uh, Berlin Azeen. But of course, it had primarily a, a political historical event. Um, as you know, you know, 1989, uh, the wall came down. Uh, so uh, Ellen and I, I was still in, in, in Switzerland, but I had a, a scholarship um, stay in, at MIT. We were thinking about how can we uh, provide a way for students 
to experience and to learn about the complexity of what was going on uh, uh, during these changes. So we didn't want to deliberately focus on aspects uh, of the, the, the big political changes. We all know that. That has been widely communicated in the news. It's written up. We know the, the, the facts. But what is the impact of these changes to individual lives of people living in Berlin? So this was really our focus. How can we rethink how students can experience how people in Berlin experience uh, uh, those changes? And that's also where the title comes from. Uh, in German, it's Berliner Sehen. So in German, it's not quite clear who sees whom. Are we seeing the Berliners, or are the Berliners seeing themselves? So this is important. It, again, it has these different perspectives, it, depending on how you look at things and from which uh, vantage point uh, you're actually looking at it. So uh, what we did, we worked with a Berlin-based uh, filmmaker, uh, and we videotaped uh, conversations between uh, people in two neighborhoods, one in, in, uh, in Prenzlauer Berg and the other one in, in Charlottenburg, because we not only wanted individual life stories, but we also wanted interconnected life stories where people could refer to similar events, to si similar experiences, again, to get these multiple perspectives onto, onto life and all these changes. So it's really looking at individual life stories and how they are changing. Uh, that has been, you know, or is supported by uh, historical film footage that we got from archives. Uh, uh, we got the, the rights for that, but not the rights for public uh, showing. Uh, so that's why you won't see anything here. It's it, in, in the program, but uh, this is the, the program is behind the uh, login uh, and, and other authentication aspects. But then we have uh, you know, about 750 photos and personal documents from public and, and, and private archives. Uh, and as I said, you know, this was a collaboration. We could not have done this uh, without the collaboration of a lot of people. Uh, um, most importantly, the Berlin-based documentary filmmaker, because we also wanted to get a typically German uh, uh, you know, Berlin a point of view into filming uh, these these conversations, and then he worked in turn with with um, a, a, a camera person who was actually a news camera person, and that had an interesting impact on the way it was filmed. So, and of course, then it was co-designed with with a number of designers, software developers. It was actually a graduate student first, you know, in computer science who who did the initial uh, development. Uh, and then, of course, you know, a number of instructors, but we are also teaching. So this came really out of our teaching experience. So what I want to give you just a very quick glimpse of the kinds of materials that are in there. The, uh, and these are uh, excerpts from the actual program. Uh, the actual program doesn't have any subtitles, but we subtitled it here so that you can actually understand what's going on and see uh, how the students jump actually into the middle of, of a conversation. Du hast das ja ziemlich lange ausgehalten alles, ne? Gibt es da eine Tapferkeitsmedaille da? Also meine Partei hat es nicht mit einer Tapferkeitsmedaille. Nein, nee, es hat mir sehr viel Spaß gemacht. Sehr viel Spaß. Es war auch eine enorme Spannung für mich, denn ich habe ja tagsüber äh, geheime Militärforschung getrieben. Das ist ja an sich schon eine spannende Sache. Geheime Militärforschung in einem völlig abgeschlossenen äh, Gebiet. Äh, wir hatten äh, an den Türen keine Klinken. Ja? Äh, wenn man rein wollte, hatte man entweder einen Schlüssel oder, äh, oder äh, musste telefonieren. Und da musste man auch wissen, mit wem man spricht vor der Tür, damit man reinkommt. Solche Arbeit habe ich gemacht. Und wenn ich dann hier abends kam, war eine ganz andere Welt. Also geheime Militärforschung tagsüber und dann hier solche Leute, so ein buntes Völkchen, das ganz andere Vorstellungen hatte, die ich langsam inhaliert habe, die mir sehr gefallen haben, sehr viel Spaß gemacht haben und immer wieder den Angstschweiß auf die Stirn, weil ich immer wieder mich verantworten musste. So you can actually see there are many layers. Of course, it's looking back in the historical terms, but also in personal, uh, personal ways of, of dealing with those issues. Let me see if that works. Uh, 
Wir haben wir uns noch nicht gekannt, als ich hier in nee. der Beats King war. Nee. Nee. <lacht> Aber wie gesagt, das habe ich, hab ich gerne gemacht durch diese Leute, die haben das ja unterwandert, den, den Ausschuss, haben sie unterwandert so, gezielt. Ja. Und das war spannend. Und mhm. Nein, vorher war ich äh, stur und... Äh, und äh, Ach, Sie waren auch, Also Sie waren... Nicht stur, aber, aber ich habe das gemacht. Äh, äh, jeder WBA lief, lief das. Ja. Das waren ja äh, Sachen, die, die nötig waren. Nicht? Sagen wir, dass man eine Baukommission hatte, die sich um den Zustand der Häuser kümmerte und ja. vorgeschlagen hat, was in welchem Haus gemacht werden ja. Es war immer wieder dasselbe. Dachdecken, weil alle Dächer kaputt waren hm. und die Keller trocken machen, zum ja. Beispiel. Ja. Oder die Hof und aufpassen. Aufpassen war mit, ja natürlich. Es gab, ja, die HGL-Vorsitzenden, die, äh, die hatten ja auch bestimmte Funktionen, zu ja. sagen, wer kriegt welchen Westbesuch ja. und so unter anderem. Ne? Ja, ja, natürlich. Ja. Ich weiß nicht, ob das die HGL-Vorsitzenden sagen mussten. Da Oder derjenige, der die, die Haus Buchführer, die Hausbuchführer, ja. genau, Sie wissen es. Die wurden befragt äh, von den entsprechenden Kräften äh, der äh, VP äh, oder, oder äh, dem MFS. Äh, wer kommt denn hier öfter äh, zu Besuch? Was steht für ein Auto vor der Tür? Was hat das für ein Kennzeichen? Und so. So these two clips you know, focus on one person. There are about 160 clips about this person, talking about many different aspects in many different constellations in bars you know, with, with uh, part of his family, his son and his grandson. So we always try to keep and connect people in different situations in their lives, mostly in, in the neighborhood. There are a total of eight uh, main characters who are in total uh, uh, conversation with about uh, 50 people. Um, so these are some of the additional documents providing contextual material uh, his, in a historical sense, but also gentrification has been an issue, it was an issue then when we actually filmed, we filmed in 95, hasn't changed much. You know, these were secret plans to tear down the neighborhood. Uh, this, these were sometimes subversive uh, meetings uh, where theater plays were shown in one of the, the inner yards, the Hirschhof in Prenzlauer Berg. Um, and these are uh, other kinds of documents announcing uh, these, these events, uh, newspaper clippings, and so on. So there's a wealth of material around that can support the students in understanding the complexity and the relationship uh, what uh, people are talking about. So, uh, and also there's, there's uh, excerpts from a Stasi Akte. Uh, and this is the interface. This is the only interface that there is. Uh, this interface allows you to access uh, these, uh, we have about 680 clips, I think, yeah. Um, and these additional materials, uh, it's by way of selecting on the one hand these main characters and then very broad notions like the self, others, relationships, uh, public sphere, and the past, uh, and then the periphery here fills with documents that all have a relationship to what one has selected. By pulling one into the center, then that becomes the focus of attention. Uh, and Ellen will now go through that and show you how it actually works and then talks about the, um, how it works in the classroom. So what you see here is the, is the interface. This is now the active interface. Students sign up and get in immediately on their, on their own um, computers at home. And uh, to start out, <clears throat> they may start out with, with absolutely nothing. That's what I usually do is to introduce how they're going to work with this. In other words, there is no video to see. There's no uh, story that's been told yet. It's going to be up to them to find the connections, to find the, the um, initially, to find connections and things that are interesting to them. Um, so in, in working with the students, we usually try to first limit what they're looking at. So rather than looking at all of these eight main characters, perhaps just looking at this person, and then to select one or two of the notions um, that he talks about in all of the, in the conversations. Now, the notions that are here, I'll quickly translate them for you, myself, he, I'm, I, myself, others, relationships, private, public, Q, 
Keats, which is a special word for Berlin, which has to do with community, but also has to do with a neighborhood um, and also private life. Uh, past, the Zeitsicht is a word that we're using for focusing on the either the future or particularly on the past from a present point of view, so from the perspective of the present. Um, and then tun and machen, which is all kinds of activities. So anything that has to do with public life or possibly private life, anything that they're doing. So the students can begin by selecting, as I said, selecting a person, let's say selecting um, one of these, perhaps the public sphere or perhaps a combination of not only the public sphere, but maybe the public sphere in relationship to their community. And each time, as you can see, each time I, I uh, add another layer of, of uh, ideas, um, the, the periphery is changing here. So the context within which I'm looking at something is changing. So we think of this outline, this edge um, selection, collection of materials as being a context, but it is endless in the, or in, the, in the minds or in the experience of the students. So the students, as the students begin to take a look at the materials, they also find that certain things are of particular interest. And for instance, here, you can see that this particular dialogue has not only to do with the way that person is looking at himself and in conversation with this other person in the public sphere and, and the community, but also these other highlighted areas here. So others and the past and perspective from today looking at the past. So as students begin to work, they find that they are, um, ex they find that there are materials that are of particular interest to them. So all they need to do is to take this clip and push it into their workspace. So let's say that, 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 that they might actually wanna go back and look at some of these other areas, okay? They might wanna go back and look at what else is going on here. So they can deselect any of this um, and, and keep getting a different relationship. Sometimes the students stick with one particular connection, all right? So they might end up having uh, several different should show that it's tagging. There we go. Um, <clears throat> so they might find several different things that they found were, were interesting to them um, in working on gentrification. And so they're saving that for another time. Because as we warn them, if you come back the next day or a couple of hours later, you're not gonna necessarily find these same things. And then when they wanna look and see what they've done, they can pull in their collection and see. So as they work, um, they can continue to collect more. And as, they've, as they begin to collect things, then they can look and see what the other students are doing. And now I've just borrowed um, a class from one of my classes so that you can see what goes on here. The students have made these collections and we can see the names of the students. Um, we can see how many clips are in there. Some of these are, are simple, simple, um, you know, single people working on um, a collection. Um, other times the students get together. So here we see two names. The students are working together to collect texts. Um, some, of the, some of the students are very productive and end up having quite a lot of materials in, in, one, in, one, uh, <clears throat> in one collection. So here we have, for instance, a student who's worked very carefully on trying to find out more about the political situation. He's got 10 different texts that he's worked with, okay? But what the students then do is they can look at each other's research, if you will, and also borrow that. So I could go back, I could say, oh, I like, I like what this person has. I think I wanna add that to my, my collection as well. And in that way, they're actually, um, they're actually ch exchanging texts, exchanging ideas. I just want to show you one other aspect, which is interesting to the students, I think. I always tell them, don't erase what you've done. <laughs> that's important. But if you find that there really is a clip that's not working for you, then you can recycle it. So we could recycle this one <laughs> and then say, OK, that's no longer tagged. But you can't recycle anybody else's 
materials. And you can recycle anybody else's collections. In teaching with Betty Nazi, and we, we've observed that there are three distinct phases in how the students are working and in the process of making meaning with this very complex content. Um, to start with, Berlin Zain has been, we really have designed it for it, it to be exploratory. Um, and the students are drawn to investigate the material and become intrigued with the process of inquiry and discovery. Initially, their focus is on the process of listening, watching, juxtaposing, which is very important in this particular, um, in our interface, and searching for connections and relationships in the content. So the students work individually at home or um, in class if we have, um, have them bring their laptops at their computers, um, exploring the material, creating their first collections. Um, usually the first task is of a general nature because this is not a search for a particular kind of information. There's no way to search anything here. The students, our students are very familiar with working with all kinds of things on the computer, but they're not used to exploring without being able to search. Um, the, the tasks encourage the students then to explore without fear of getting something wrong. Um, so a first homework assignment might be um, to collect clips and other kinds of documents that they find um, that best represent one of the, or two possibly of the main figures in Berlin Um The next day in class, uh, they form small groups to work collaboratively at the board to collect and record the information they find pertinent to the story um, of that person. So I just wanna show you here um, a clip, and I'm going to tell you afterwards what's going on. Um, just I want you to watch what the students are doing and how they're working here at the board as they're collecting what they find. Their roles are very different. In this collaborative process, a student may discover that he or she has actually found a piece of evidence that the others haven't seen yet, and that's what we saw here. Okay, so what does this look like in terms of the next piece that might happen? Once the students have begun to collaborate, they begin to they find their own ideas. They begin to realize um, that they are understanding what's, what they think is going on. Um, so once they've collected enough information, um, they can begin to write, and we have them write um, short texts um, as, again, an, an input to the further class discussion. Um, here we can already see indicators that reveal the process of how the students work. Um, it's a portrait of one of the figures that students have been, have been investigating based on the collections and the documents and on the conversations in class, because that has also informed them. 
Um, so let's just take a look and see how this is. And I'm not, I can't begin to translate for you, but it is a portrait by one of the students. And um, you can see in, um, in yellow quite a few quotes. I think you can probably see how he's, in, this person has included quotation marks. So he's actually quoting people's voices um, that give authenticity to his story and substantiate his interpretation of the conversation in the video clips. In addition to direct quotes, he also makes reference to further clips by paraphrasing them, and those are in gray, if you look at the, towards the bottom of the text, towards the end, bringing in other voices. By cross-referencing with these other voices, these other speakers, he's actually expanding the context of the portrait. So, and then what's very interesting here, in an attempt to connect further information the student has found pertinent to the story, he's building hypotheses and those I've um, shown in green, um, that, he that he substantiates with his own observations. So what we find is that as the students are working, moving from collecting to beginning to make meaning, that hypothesis building is an incredibly necessary step in the creation of new stories and the creation of knowledge. So the student is now also incorporating here um, <clears throat> uh, at the end, in fact, even a historical reference, which helps him to um, give further context to this story. So moving to the second phase of what goes on, in the second phase, um, the students are pooling their information on a particular Berlin resident that they have been investigating. So this is, I'm going to show you another little video. It's a collaborative process, and it is interesting to observe that each of the students is participating from the position of an expert. So there's no one person, including the teacher, um, that is directing this conversation. So please keep in mind that the teacher is behind the camera here and not trying to um, elicit any um, responses. Uh, the yeah, ich denke, es gibt die drei, die Ja. ja. Nein? Die Tante von Dresden, ja. Von Dresden. Von Dresden. Es ist eine Stadt. Es ist eine Stadt. Es ist in der Nähe von Dresden. Nein. So ist die Tante von Deutschland. Warum sagt die Tante? Aber es ist as the students continued, um, one of the students suggested that, in fact, the best thing to do would be to go back to the original clip and take a look um, and see, in fact, what they could hear again by looking at it. So they were checking with each other. They were checking their comprehension, but they were also checking how they could understand what was going on. How could they understand the line of reasoning that they were working with? Okay, I'd like to take a quick look at a, a just this, just so that you can see that at this stage, students also work at different um, levels. They they here, the students are collecting, again, information. Um, and they're working with two timelines. They're working with a timeline that they're creating for the person. But they're also working with a timeline on the history of Berlin. So we can think of this as reconfiguring the material. They haven't seen this in any kind of a chronological way. But as they begin to reconfigure what's going on, what they're understanding. Um, as students continue, they begin to make a more extended um, idea of what's going on. They're synthesizing with more different kinds of information, but they're going further in that, um, in that understanding. So here at the beginning of the text, you can see I've marked in red, um, the student has actually decided to reframe um, what he's saying. So not only looking at it, perhaps reconfiguring, but to reframe it and saying, this material that we're looking at doesn't sound like the films that I'm used to hearing about conversations among people in the GDR. 
And so he takes this other frame and then creates a, his ideas around his report on what's going on, what he thinks is going on, um, using this new frame. Um, he substantiates his arguments, and he actually creates an extended synthesis here. But I want to quickly show you um, two examples of, well, actually one example of what goes on in phase three. So phase three, um, I'm not saying that everybody, each class always reaches phase three, but a typical phase three for me would be when the students have worked f long enough and figured out, a not, not long enough, but in terms of time, but in terms of what they've been able to find, that they're ready to actually um, do their own discussion, their own discussion of what's going on. So this becomes, if you want, a, an extended storytelling. So it's not no longer just the telling a story of a one person or perhaps a community, but looking at these people from their own perspective. And here we can see um, an, an example of a, of a final discussion where students have actually made theses which are uh, highlighted in yellow and uh, they're in their uh, one line uh, one line of an of a possible argument and um, this goes on for several pages there were quite a few students here but what happens then is the students then actually discuss um, with without notes what they think is going on and it's very interesting this particular group decided to talk about the um, the trustworthiness of one of the figures, and it's actually the man that we've been seeing, the older man, um, in his relationship to his family and, and to others in the Keats, and, and how this may be positively or negatively um, it, it affected his social or professional roles. It was a very interesting conversation. The students went on for, for at least 20 minutes. Um, I'd love to show you to the whole thing, but it's, a, it's just a talking heads show really here. But it's, it's very interesting that they were able to maintain this conversation without my interplay, um, without my interaction, um, and were able to disagree, agree with each other, were able to pull up arguments, all based on what they've been um, observing um, and what they've been working with in, in, in the materials. So to just pull this together a bit, I'd just like to say um, I've described or tried to describe one way of working with Bidin Azay, and this is based on uh, primarily on my own courses, my own classes. Um, but there are many possibilities for working with these materials, um, not necessarily specific to any one proficiency level. Um, and if we think of that, um, this material is very complex, but it depends on the tasks, and the tasks need to be appropriate, not only to the material, but also to the level of the students. Um, colleagues in Germany, in, 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 in the United States, in German studies, um, are making Berliner Seen, are using Berliner Seen as a core component of their curricula um, in courses that, um, that focus perhaps on Berlin or other courses that focus on literature and also on memory. So there's a, there's a, broad, there's a broad scope of different kinds of courses that have, have already started to, or have been working, not started, but have been working for a while now. Um, using Berina Sein as a core component. So I just want to quickly uh, cycle it back to, I'm just holding it right now as well, uh, to uh, digital humanities. But as you can see, uh, you know, the material is really based on people's life stories. And people are trying, the students are trying to retell their own interpretation of these stories. You know, sometimes they are similar to, of course, what's going on, but by pooling all the information together, they're coming actually closer, potentially, to uh, the true life story. But how do we know that the people actually themselves, the Berliners, are actually telling us their real life stories? So this is, we, of course, they were in front of the camera. So all these issues come up, and as Ellen just mentioned, even issues of trust. You know, can you trust a person? Because you see the people in so many different contexts. So suddenly a notion of trust comes up at that kind of level. Uh, and this is really amazing. You know, when you think about a literature class, you know, these kind of interactions, of course, are totally normal. 
But when you think about this is an, on the third level of, of German, you know, this is the third to the fourth semester, and this is all happening in German. So we've really seen interactions that otherwise we see only on much, much higher levels. You know, and all these references uh, to, uh, you know, historical events, but also their own associations about their, their world knowledge and so on. So what's really happening is that the students engage in the social construction of knowledge. And I think this is, becomes very clear, as Ellen said, you know, they're really ethnographers or documents documentary makers. So they're making their own you know, understanding of that, while at the same time develop a very traditional humanistic skills. You know, it's close reading of these documents, uh, textual media analysis, uh, then they do writing, persuasive writing, um, and critical thinking, and of course, you know, storytelling. So we see those students as novice scholars who actually practice the same kind of activities you know, that, that uh, you know, established scholars do. And this comes back then to John Unsworth, uh, who established, as you might know, you know, the scholarly primitives. And these are some of the core activities that uh, humanists across the disciplines in the humanities actually do. And that's discovering, annotating, comparing, referring, sampling, illustrating, representing. And this, these are the things that are actually going on uh, always simultaneously uh, what the students are actually doing. Not always, of course, knowingly, but this is exactly what they're trying uh, to do in, in, in that aspect. And since we talked before about the public impact and, you know, how this does it go further, so this uh, project was taken up by, by the Zeit, the weekly German uh, newspaper very early on because it has been online the project you know since 19 years um, since 1997 for 19 years uh, without interruption you know of course technology changes all the time but it's still the same interface the same material um, and uh, this also had then other uh, impacts in terms of uh, radio interviews and so on. so this was really discussed as a new way of getting students involved in uh, German history uh, and so on. And it's still remarkable to see how many people are using it. And quite often we don't even know who's using it because uh, one can also use it just without really uh, you know, signing up for a class and so on. So that's it. I think